Let me begin tonight with some shocking statistics. Despite making up only 4.4% of the global population, the U.S. holds nearly 25% of the world's prison population. Approximately 2.2 million people are behind bars in this country, making the United States the world leader in incarceration, according to the American Civil Liberties Union. For the children of those in prison, what's left behind for them after the cell door slams is often tragic and rife with adversity. In the new Independent Lens documentary, Trey, Mason, Dasan, filmmaker Denali Tiller focuses the camera on the young and the innocent caught in the crosshairs of the incarceration system. Here's a look. Where did you guys think that I was when I was away? What was it? It was a prison. How do you feel when you come up here? I feel great, because I love seeing you. I know you got resentment towards me. It's a hard relationship with him and me. Trey Mason Dasan, part of Independent Lens on PBS. And Denali joins me now. Denali, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. So this film is just dripping with emotion in a way that I think viewers might not be expecting. This is a population, children of people who are incarcerated, who we hear a lot about, but why was it so important for you to have us hear from them in their own words? First of all, within conversations around criminal justice reform um, and, and the prison system itself, we rarely hear about the kids and the families that are affected. So a lot of the conversations are around the people that are actually behind bars and victims, but Really, there hasn't been a lens on the collateral effects of a person's incarceration. And then within that conversation itself, we talk a lot about the kids, just like you said, but what are they really going through? Mm -hmm. And part of that for me was also in, in terms of destigmatization, it doesn't affect one type of kid. There's not one kid profile that fits every child who has an incarcerated parent. So with, b between the three of them, Trey, Mason, and Dasan, and they're all different ages, and mm -hmm. they come from different family backgrounds, and they have different schools, and so they're really different children. And, and that became really important, too, is, is just deconstructing some of our potential biases around kids who have parents in prison. Well, this story could have taken place anywhere, but how was it that you were able to uh, focus on this one particular community in Rhode Island? Well, Rhode Island is actually really unique um, mm -hmm. in terms of the corrections department in Rhode Island has a unique focus on families and a, a particularly unique focus on children. Mm -hmm. And so they have these visiting hours, which you see in the film, that are really kind of unprecedented mm -hmm. across the country in terms of the children come into a space that is built for kids. It has, you know, all the paintings on the walls mm -hmm. and they have games and wrestling mats and balls that they can throw around um, and they don't come in with another adult guardian. So they get one-on-one -on -one time with their parent to really strengthen and build a bond um, that, that's really important for the children and also for the parents. And part of the uniqueness also is that Rhode Island is so small that it's, you know, even if you live across the state, it might only be 45 minute drive to see mm -hmm. your parent. Um, whereas of course in New York, um, you know, it's up to 10 hours driving yeah. to see your parent. And when you don't have access to transportation, that can become uh, very difficult. You might not be able to see your parent for a long time. Of course you mentioned uh, the three children, how they're so different. Um, we're introduced to Trey, Mason, and Dasan. I'm wondering how you came across these three young people and their stories. Well, Mason, and this will come to no surprise for anyone that's seen the film, but he actually came up to me in the visiting hours and he had heard that I was there, you know, I'm a new face, people hadn't seen me before mm -hmm. and he found out that I was making this film and he actually came up and said, I heard you're making a movie and I have a production company and if you're looking for some help. <laughs> so he, we actually made a short film and, and his production company, TT Media, was a co-producer on that um, before we continued to make the feature film. And then, you know, Trey, I met through the social workers. He had actually just started seeing his dad again mm -hmm. when, when I first met him. And they um, pointed him out as a potential um, participant for the film because of his age, because of his relationship with his father. And, you know, we went to the mall the first time we hung out and just really 
grew a bond between us, um, and, and I'm still very close with all three of the, the kids. Um, and then Stephanie and Dasan, Dasan and his mom Stephanie, I met about a year after the other two when I got access to the women's prison. Stephanie was released very shortly after I met them, so, mm -hmm. so she gets out at the beginning of the film and you see her process of reentry with Dasan. So. And so within the film, like even dealing with uh, Trey's story, which is um, you got an amazing amount of access to his life uh, through his eyes. And you notice that when a parent is incarcerated, who becomes the child's main caretaker can sometimes be up in the air. We see that with Mason, where it's not exactly clear where he's going to be staying long term. And we see some of the problems that arise in Trey's home life as well. Mm -hmm. Caretakers are really, really important. And again, a really overlooked population. There's not a lot of support out there for caretakers. For men who are incarcerated, usually the child's mother, in most cases, would be the caretaker. For women that are incarcerated, it's usually grandparents. Mm -hmm. And sometimes dads, but, but usually grandparents. And so grandparents become really huge in a lot of these situations and you see that in the film Mason lives with his grandmother mm -hmm. and while Dasan's uh, mom was incarcerated he lived with his grandparents um, and then Trey lives with his mom at home so and then some kids go into foster care as well so I did want to circle back to some of the emotion of the film just even from the very beginning of this film uh, we see the kids in the visiting center and uh, Trey, who sort of, well, he's a 13-year-old. I would say that, you know, he builds himself up, but he's 13. And yet you see this, as soon as he sees his father, this hard exterior that he probably has built up um, in his regular life melts away, and he sobs like a baby with yeah. his dad. And that really happened every week when I first met Trey. And that's one thing that really drew me to him and his story is just kind of tackling all of those emotions and really trying to understand where they were coming from and really what what that was for him mm -hmm. and yeah it, it, you follow these emotions and his father's emotions too you know through the course of the film and um, I think it's particularly important for people to see Trey and his father expressing the emotions because that you know Trey is one of the more challenging kids in terms of you know, his behavior out on the streets and getting into trouble and uh, he has an ankle monitor on at one point in the film. And so it, there's a lot of things that people might think about kids like Trey, particularly in the classroom when mm -hmm. teachers are dealing with a child that is dealing with some behavioral problems. And, and so I, I felt that it was really important for people to be able to see Trey's emotions and for Trey to be able to share those with us um, as the audience. And also, uh, in the story of Dasan and his mom, at one point, her parole officer comes to the house, and we see her ask him, you know, don't say the J word, as in J-A-I-L, because he hadn't been told yet. Did you find that that was, I don't know if I want to say common, but how much the kids really understand? We see that with some of the older kids, Mason and Trey, but Dasan didn't really have a full understanding of where his mom went. Yeah, and that's actually really common for, for parents to say, especially if they're on a sh shorter sentences, um, because of the stigma involved. Not only the shame that a parent might have for being incarcerated, but they know there's a stigma in, in classrooms and in, in the community if you have a parent in prison. So they'll say, oh, I'm, I'm working upstate, or I'm um, in the military, I'm in college. And so Dasan's mom had told him and um, and his little cousin Olivia, who's also in the film, that she was away at a special school for grown-ups. And so that's really where he thought she was for two years. And he was six, so mm -hmm. yeah. you know, he's he's a bit younger and he wants to believe his mom. And but one thing that especially, you know, the social workers really try and tell parents is kids are gonna find out. And so is it better for them to find out from you? Mm -hmm. Or is it better for them to find out from, you know, someone it might be a classmate appear, it might be um, someone in the family talking that they overhear. And that can really shatter any trust that they had with you. And they're probably already dealing with trust issues if, if you've gone away mm -hmm. for some reason. So that was a really important conversation to have in the film as well, just to help parents that might be seeing the film, first of all, know that it's okay, mm -hmm. that Dasan and his mom had actually 
strengthened their relationship to have this conversation. And also the language that Stephanie was using, you know, really do you know what a timeout is? You know, I was in a grown up timeout and, and using language that kids that age can really understand and connect with so that it's not such a big scary thing, but it's something that they can feel comfortable asking questions about and knowing that it doesn't affect their parents' ability to parent or their love that they have for each other. Yeah, of um, course. So that that's a really, you know, important thing for, for kids to be able to have. Well, like I said, it's an incredibly powerful film and it's from a a uh, group or a population that we often hear about but we rarely hear from. So thank you so much for making this film. Thank you. Trey Mason Desan premieres Monday, April 1st at 10 p.m. Check your local listings for additional airtimes and streaming opportunities.